Hello and welcome back to Pixel Sift for episode 43. My name is Gianni and I had a great break last week as I'm sure my co-hosts did as well and they are Mitch and Scott. Hey, hey. I was bored. Were you bored? You missed yeah. us. I was here on Thursday. No one told me to. Oh, did you? <laughs> no, <I'm just laughs> hope not, hope not. Today we're also joined <laughs> over Skype by Steve Heller. He's uh, of Surprise Attack Games. Steve, thanks for joining us. All right, thanks for having me, guys. Very welcome. Uh, we'll be talking to Steve a little bit a, la- a little bit later about publishing games, and he's also going to share his opinion on the following topics. Mitch? Yeah, we're also talking new consoles, the Xbox One S and the PS4 Neo 4.5, or whatever you want to call it, amongst other things. Yeah, and our last topic today, we'll be looking at the differences between AAA and indie game prices. Is it hype? Is it budget? We'll find out very soon. Sounds good. And all that and more on today's episode of Pixel Sift. Though first up, uh, we've got a brand new segment for you. It is the shipping news with Brian Fairbanks. Thanks, Brian. In local gaming news, Perth Studio Black Lab Games recently won West Australian Game of the Year at the WA Screen Awards for their game Starhammer, The Vanguard Prophecy really great dedicated team and the game is a lot of fun it's a bit reminiscent of the homeworld games uh, particularly homeworld cataclysm in which you operate ships with space combat and in 3d you have to examine the angles of your ship's approach at not only front to back and side to side but from bottom to top as well it really adds another dimension quite literally to ship combat give that game a go you can find it on steam Penny Arcade Expo is coming to Australia in November, and local developer Jacob Generica's game Paradigm has made it into the PAX Indie Showcase. This is huge because it's a small collection of high-quality indie games from Australia and also New Zealand. So it's huge in terms of exposure, and Jacob describes it as a cross between the Mighty Boosh, LucasArts Adventure Games, and Fallout. You can find more information at paradigmadventure.com. And as you've most likely heard, groundbreaking exploration game no man's sky has just been released and everybody is just obsessed with it it is what you might not have heard is that game creator and developer sean murray sent a special heartfelt note attributing his inspiration to the natural wonders of australia as he grew up in the outback he says i know my strongest memory growing up in the outback of australia seeing the stars at night and feeling overwhelmed reading sci-fi and wishing I could escape into those worlds. If for one small moment I can make some people feel that they have stepped through a science fiction book cover, or to think briefly about the size of our universe, then I'll be happy with that. It's nice to think that in our age of mind-blowing technological advances and comforts, a simple night sky is still a source of wonder and inspiration. Well done, Sean Murray. That was No Man's Sky, and you absolutely must check that one out as well. Space Exploration Game. And that was Gaming News. You're listening to Pixel Sim. All right, so for the longest time, the main advantage of console gaming has been you buy one unit that would fill all your gaming needs for like that whole generation. But the, um, yeah, so, so I guess upgrading graphics cards and finding drivers wasn't really a problem. But now I think that's about to change with the idea of sticking to one machine might be a thing of the past. Mm. It used to be a big factor. Uh, I used to be one of the, uh, the you know, the PC, PC master race. <laughs> and I've come back to that again. But during the middle of the Xbox... You have a Mac. Well, you know, that's a PC. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, no Mac shaming here, right? It's a, I'm, I'm in media, so I need all this stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, having a console that I didn't need to worry about having compatibility with, worrying yeah. about drivers, uh, having the right amount of RAM and all of that sort of stuff was, a, you know, an important factor for having a console for me. Um, but it looks like that there's both uh, Sony and Microsoft are moving towards a... I'm, I think it's probably more like a mobile phone model. Where, well, that looks like it, yeah. Yeah, mm. and you kind of move, you basically upgrade incrementally every two years and kind of have little bits and pieces on, you know, bit, bits and pieces changed. Uh, what do we think about? Oh, what do I think? What do you think? Uh, I've got lots of thoughts. I'm not obviously, uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. I don't think it's a, it's going to be good. I don't think the phone model is something, you know, commendable. It's great. They've earned a lot of money, but it's a terribly wasteful, uh, you know, uh, practice to just release things constantly and, and also like uh, instill things with a, t- with a, you know, with a time frame and, a, and an end life. You know, it's, it's like light, light bulb conspiracy stuff. 
Um, it's there's too much problems there uh, in invested interest in your equipment not lasting for a long time, basically, because they want you to basically they want you to buy more more often. That's what it comes down to. So the first example of this now is we have the Xbox One S, and that's actually out. You can get that, and so far in regards to performance, it's largely the same. I mean, it, like it doesn't like. It's not like a new phone that has like mm. double the RAM and like mm. double the performance. So it's pretty much just a smaller unit. And this is nothing new in the I industry. think it all it does is the 4K Blu-rays effectively yeah. and that's about it. But, but like it, this this has been, this has existed since the PS2. Like there was a slim version of that. This PS3 also had a slim version of that. Yeah. Like and, and it also kind of brings the cost down almost. But see, that's different. Like I feel of yeah. what they're trying to do now is that it's not going to be cheaper. It'll right. be better, but it'll just be the new, uh, you know, figurehead for that generation kind of thing or, you know, the generation 0. 0.5 or whatever. The problem, uh, you know, I, I have here is that let, let's call it the not even the phone model. Let's call it the iPhone model. iPhones are not the best phones out there, especially, uh, you know, um, performance wise that's quite known and even like accessory wise they're the most popular and people buy them all the time because of marketing that's really what it all comes down to you know if people were all about performance then they'd probably all have you know modular android phones but also i think there's a factor talking about one particular model in that the iphone for example there is only one type of phone that comes out a year effectively so if people are making apps for them everyone who's got one has the same type um, Steve, what are some of the uh, the thoughts from coming from a sort of a publisher perspective to, I guess, further fragmenting uh, the sort of console console base? Well, actually, I think it does the opposite of fragmenting the uh, user base. We have a we have a console generation right now where it is predominantly a lot of people are starting to jump on the PC bandwagon again because mm. the games are looking better, the games are cheaper, and access to a decent priced PC isn't that much more than a console considering the lifespan of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got developers who are like trying to push the edge of what their console hardware can do and it just can't compete in with a PC, especially when you're looking at stuff like PlayStation VR versus an Oculus or a Vive, right? Like everyone's expecting the uh, the PlayStation VR to be just as amazing as the uh, other two headsets, but it absolutely can't be because it doesn't have the horsepower. So basically what they have to do is come out with a model that makes sense. So unifying that platform. So then three Xbox generations from now, whatever the platform update is. So the third Scorpio, we'll mm -hmm. go with that. Uh, if it can still play everything that my Xbox One can, all of a sudden I've got this huge library of games and I don't have to update every year. That's the same as like I could keep an iPhone until my contract runs out, right? Uh, so you're going to have that segment of the fan base that I have to have the newest, the greatest, the best, but you also don't at the same time. Um, from a developer standpoint, though, it's also how do I optimize my game to be able to work on even just the previous iteration, right? I think that's where it becomes tricky. Like looking at the plans for the, the PS4 upgrade, I have to try and convince people to buy that, right? And then I have to be able to make my game to push the limit of that. But I also have to meet these stringent guidelines to make sure it works on the original PS4. The question is, how long are the console platform holders going to uh, put that in place? And if right? you're a smaller so developer, I imagine it would be, you know, there's only a finite amount of resources that you can get dedicate to, uh, you know, a certain game. Uh, I'm sure there would be some hard choices that people would have to make on, along those lines as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, if you take a game like No Man's Sky, right, like a game that everyone has been so pumped for for the longest time, if they were like, hey, you have to buy the next version of the PS4 and it's only going to work on that one, mm -hmm. and there's been a few generations in between, sure, I'll do the upgrade if I want that game badly enough, right? Um, so there just needs to be sort of, like, I mean, if I'm upgrading my console every three years as opposed to every six years, I think I'm okay with that. If I can still play my back catalog of games so I don't have to keep another machine hanging around to play, uh, you know, my last Killzone game, if I can still play that on the new console, which is why it's really exciting to see what Microsoft's doing with unifying their platform with Windows 10. Like, I'm just going to have thousands of games by the time we're done with this available to play on my PC and my console, right? It seems like so, um, yeah. with Valve making the Steam machines, there was a sort of blur between, and now Microsoft is doing the same thing as well, uh, between the lines of a, a PC and a, and a, and a console. Um, yeah, hopefully when it comes down to it, we'll have a, a situation where you have got this huge archive of, of games um, that you can play on any device going forward. And we won't have some of these situations where you have to dig out an old uh, NES and try yeah. and find some way to play it. A, a good example of how this, you could, you could probably look at the effects of leaving the old generation behind is the new generation, the new expansion to Destiny is now leaving the PS3 behind. Mm. So, and Xbox behind. So, this will be a good one to look at 
in regards to how leaving the previous generation behind could affect the game. And there yeah. are people who are always going to play the older consoles as well. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. They don't go away. Like, someone doesn't come to your house and take it away if you buy a new one. <laughs> a couple of really yeah. good points I'd like just like to say that yep. Stephen said was, yeah, that bridging that gap between the PC and the console thing, it's, you know, it's almost not worth it to go to console anymore, especially if it's going to go in this kind of... Uh, based on the fact that consoles are cheaper and easier and whatever, yeah. especially because consoles are cheaper and easier. Uh, sorry, PCs are cheaper and easier to make than they've ever been. Uh, and the other one was, yeah, what we're talking about is um, the 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 backwards compatibility. That kind of does take away from a lot of was the negative sides of what I was saying. Mm. I love that, and I also love the idea that it won't be a huge switch over. Um, you know, it's not going to be a massive upheaval of community from one console to the next. Yeah. It'll be a slow kind of change over, which I I really like that side of things. Yeah, you and your mate playing on Xbox One one and yeah. xbox one scorpio can play a game together um and that sounds like a great situation mm. let's uh jump into our next topic did you know pixel Ziv is available on other platforms you can find previous episodes on itunes pocket Casts, youtube and on the pixel Ziv website Now, Steve Hell is still on the line with us. We introduced him at the top of the show. He is a community manager and production coordinator at Melbourne's Surprise Attack Games. Uh, now, Steve, for people who have never heard of Surprise Attack, uh, what is Surprise Attack and what do you do there? Yeah, cool. So we're an indie publishing label. So we're basically like an indie record label, but for games. Um, so we're a little bit different to a traditional publisher. We're a uh, four-person operation. Um, we join with smaller dev teams to help uh, bolster their team. So we usually work with teams that are like one to three or four persons so we can make a big team and work together on the journey of releasing an indie game. And what are some of the things that uh, you do to kind of help that journey come to a, a good conclusion? Yeah, right. So me personally, like um, I'm now in a production sort of role. So basically setting dev timelines, um, making sure that everything's running smoothly. If it's not, how we can minimize the risk, make sure we actually have dates for when games come out. So we have something to work towards. Um, and then community management's just, you know, um, speaking with our fans. But we as a team, we also uh, do all like the store negotiations, the distribution platforms. We uh, help with the marketing and PR. We help with design choices. Um, a very important thing to us as a label is the development always has creative control but we find when you're such a small team getting an outside perspective and us throwing some you know ideas could uh change the way that you're thinking about your game um hopefully for the better um what are some of the things yeah, that so you guys sort of what have do. suggested what are some of the things you've suggested that have kind of changed the direction that um people may may, may know of? um yeah so for instance a, a game that we're working on uh which was uh called road continuum um it was just like this kind of fun, but kind of going nowhere, top-down shooter. And we're like, oh, well, you kind of, it's brutally hard and you've got this system of planets. Why don't you make it kind of like a roguelike where you're trying to buff up your characters as you're running through? And then these guys are like, oh, yeah, never even thought about that. Let us sit on that for a week. And then the next build we got back, we're like, oh, damn, this game is like 10 times better than what we thought it was when we signed it. So, you know, just stuff like that. Are there some things that you see kind of commonly that people miss uh, in the smaller development teams or things that are sort of common mistakes? Uh, I think a common mistake, particularly for teams just starting out, is uh, overscoping their game. Particularly, um, I see it all. Uh, I see a lot of people come out of uh, university or stuff like that, and are like, "Oh, I'm going to make a three thousand hour RPG," and I've never released a game before. And uh, you learn very quickly that that's really hard, especially if you've never released a game before in a team. Um, so yeah, usually overscope and feature creep is a big. Uh, common problem with newer teams that we see out there. Um, but another common problem we see even with experienced team is oh, I've finished the game and I'm going to release it and uh, don't know how to, how important marketing is. Um, making sure that people actually know about your game. Cause you can just release a game on steam now and make $0 just because there's like so many games coming out every day on the platform. Now, uh, back in the day when steam was uh, still fairly new, you could just put a game out there and be guaranteed. It's going to get some store exposure, going to get some eyes on it. Whereas now like that's, almost impossible you have to work really hard to make that happen is it is it difficult to like rein those teams in like do you find that like it's difficult to like kind of direct that passion in a way that you need it to go um not really like the all the teams that we've worked with have been um really on the ball and sort of understand that we have the knowledge with them and like our whole uh ethos is that if you release the first game with us, you should know how to release the second one by yourself if you want to, right? It's going to be a lot more work. But we kind of, um, we don't just say we're doing this and that's the thing. We, we like, we need to do this and here's why we need to do it and here's the steps that we take. And we make sure that the developer is on board with every step of the process, even if they're not the one doing the work. Um, so it's like, 
our founder was um, ex marketing manager at THQ. He was a marketing manager at Xbox in the UK. Like he's worked all around the place. Um, our communications manager worked for Disney. So like we've got a lot of in house experience um, with bigger companies, and we're just sharing that knowledge with uh, the indie space, which is awesome. And how does that fit in with uh, Australian? developers and you've got some I get noticed you just got one a new one based uh, overseas as well uh, with Orwell uh, the game Orwell um, how, how does that fit in how do we fit into the the global scene uh, can we punch above our, our weight uh, absolutely we can punch above our weight like our biggest game to date has been Hacknet which was made by Matt Trebbiani which is a one-man sort of operation out of Adelaide um, and he's uh, sold quite a number of copies and was in the Steam Top 10 for a very long time and it's got a whole bunch of press and all the really good stuff. Um, there are some really great games coming out of Australia. Like we're trying to get a pretty good balance of about 60 to 70% on the label being Australian made, but every now and then we just find a really good game overseas that we believe in. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really exciting teams here that we're hoping, like even games that we don't sign that we talk to in Australia, like we're always open to giving advice because that's the whole point that we're trying to do with the label is build a local scene that has knowledge and understands how to market games and make great games. Like we're not just in it to make some sweet money and say we're a publisher. Like we actually believe in really building something special here in Australia. And a lot of that is done in Melbourne just because that's where we are. But a big mission for us over the next uh, 24 months is to do a lot more traveling around Australia, which I've already started doing um, and just seeing what's happening in all the other cities and making sure that, you know, we know the projects that are out there that are really cool and um, offer advice where we can. You should pop by Perth. It's uh, lovely all times <laughs> of the year. I heard there's going to be a sweet Christmas party. So I might yeah, have, uh, yeah. come on down to that one. Um, <laughs> Do you think that, uh, you know, Melbourne obviously has got a very vibrant scene. You've got the arcade where you guys are based. Um, you've got a lot of sort of state government funding and a good sort of uh, community of people that are already there. Do you think we can make, uh, or you know, are you in touch with some of the other groups that are around? Like, you know, I know there's a big group in Tasmania we've spoken to before. Um, there's people in Brisbane as well. And do you think we can kind of spread that out from, from Melbourne across the country? Yeah, that's, I guess that's the big uh, question, right? So what I really love about the uh, development communities all across Australia, they're all very different from one another. And I think we just need to be better about communicating ideas and knowledge. And so, as you said, like state government funding in Victoria is a big reason why there are so many people here because we can get funding from the government. It takes a little bit of pressure off on a small team. Um, I went and spent some time in Brisbane and you got uh, people like Defiant, like Morgan Jaffa and uh, Hand of Fate and they're very business orientated because they have to worry about the money. So they need to make sure that their game is viable and going to at least, you know, put food on the table. Um, so it's a very different approach to down here where things are a little bit more arty and um, considered in that way. And then Tasmania is a very young community. They've got some really great experienced people there, but they also have a bunch of hobbyist developers who really want to step up their game and make something special. And that's really awesome to see. Like it's super exciting. So um, I'm not, entirely sure what the scene is like in Perth. Um, so I'll, I'll get over there. I promise I will. But it's just, it's really great to see that there are different flavors of developers in every city. Um, and like, we've even got some really awesome developers who are working in like rural Victoria and stuff like that, who travel down to Melbourne, like once a month to show off their games. And that's another thing that on a personal level, I really want to try and work something out is how we can do sort of a rural showcase or work out some sort of like knowledge sharing on Twitch or something like that, because I'm from a rural town myself. And I know that people are out there think they're alone and they're really not and have hard, hard to get access to other people who understand what they're about, um, especially in the gaming space. Do you think, uh, you know, with, you know, advent of technology like the NBN, I know some regional <laughs> areas have got them uh, set up already. <laughs> uh, do you think that'll make a bit of a difference for, for people being able not only to connect with some other groups, but also, I guess, telecommute uh, their work into these bigger... Yeah, centers? absolutely, right? Like, the NBN is such a huge issue, not even just uh, for gaming, just for tech space in Australia. Mm. Like, I don't know if you guys saw, not to rub it in, but Melbourne just won Most Livable City for eighth year in a row today, right? Um, tech companies are interested in setting up here, but yeah. we can't give them network infrastructure they need. Like, that is a huge problem for so many reasons, right? And then, yeah, just in the gaming sector, like we actually rely on being able to log into conferences from home. Like I, you, you can't pay the, you know, $2,500 to get over and go to GDC, but you can pay to get an online pass to watch the things. But if your internet is so bad that you can't stream it, then that is a huge issue, right? Um, but, you know, government is government. There's not much we can do about it. 
All you can do is move to an area that's already set up. I think, uh, you know, some of the people I've spoken to, Darcy, who's in uh, the League, League of Geeks uh, in the arcade as well, and he says, yep, I'm going to move to a new house that's got an MBN-enabled area. So literally last month, my roommate and I, we moved to a suburb simply because it had MBN in a terrible house just so we could stream. And when you live in one of the, the lucky countries in the world, and the, that is a consideration of where I move, is dictated by where I can access decent internet, it's kind of shit right it's a bit ridiculous <laughs> yeah well look steve we've uh, all thought about it <laughs> very very interesting to hear all this stuff uh stick around because we will jump into our next topic right now pixel sift <laughs> pixel sift no seriously pixel sift <laughs> no seriously pixel sift for our last topic today, we thought we'd look into the varying worlds of AAA and indie game title releases. Uh, a lot of us are aware that amazing indie games are available and do come out, but we're generally not made as aware of their release or even development. And if we are, they're usually overshadowed by some AAA release anyway. This can be blamed on many different factors that we will be taking into consideration today. Why do indie games get so much less attention? Why do they hold such a lesser value? Why don't we see the same divide in other versions of media, let's say film and cinema? Why, why, why? Stephen, you are in quite an interesting position compared to the rest of us. Um, do you have any light to shine on this topic today? I have so many thoughts about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. So, oh, yeah, so I guess, uh, I guess the question I want to throw to you guys is what makes you pay attention to an indie game? Ooh. Well, I, I mean, uh, we're, I think we're a bit of an exception because of uh, position in the kind of gaming media realm. Um, and yep. we like to, we pride ourselves on, you know, being a part and, and finding out all these indie games sort of thing. Um, yeah, right. So I don't know. It's kind of like you could, you could attribute it to indie films and, uh, triple A blockbusters, right. In, in cinema terms, right. Everyone knows the blockbusters. That's why they make so many sequels and they reboot the same movies every, every like 10 years type deal. Um, and that's what we're seeing in games because those games sell well, but they cost like hundreds of millions of dollars. So they have to make small iterations, right? So no one's taking risks. And then you just have this weird sort of art community that is making just weird stuff, like really weird stuff. Like who's your daddy, which sells 600,000 copies on steam. Mm. Like what is that game even? Right. Um, so the problem with that, though, is Steam. I think Steam is like the biggest proponent of indie games, right? Like indie games on consoles are just not to the same level. But now there are like hundreds of games released every week. So how do you know what to buy? That's an interesting point you made, you made actually. And you you did uh, you said it in the last topic as well. Um, you referred to independent gaming problems on Steam in that there's too many options now. I mean, I mean, how can you get through that like marketing barrier? If if you know Steam was was the independent kind of you know source, uh, how do you how do you break through Steam once that gets inundated with triple A's? That's right, and it's really hard too because like for press, right? Like no one who's reading games for IGN really cares about indie games unless it's something like No Man's Sky that's just been hyped through like the biggest hype train in the world. Yeah. So you can't go there to get your information. You can go to your rock paper shotguns or you can go here or there, but once again, they can only write about a certain amount of games because they've only got a certain number of hours every week. Um, so that's where streaming has become more reliant on streamers are out there trying to find, oh, no one's streaming this and this looks interesting. I'm going to do that and then hope that it catches on, right? So that's been really interesting to see that shift even in just the last couple of years. Um, like I find out about a lot of games via just stumbling on streams. I'm like, oh, what the hell is this game? I've never heard of it before. And then, you know, um, and then also like these steam sales are a big issue too. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I have hundreds of games in my backlog that I've never even launched before. Um, Humble Bundle and I'm is almost... a big factor of that as well. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I think there's a factor as well that these games probably before these mechanisms existed, people wouldn't probably pay anything for them. Um, but now you can get them at a very affordable rate, uh, in a steam sale or in a, in a Humble Bundle and you just kind of collect them, but then you don't really want to pay more than than that particular price because you might as well just wait for the next Humble Bundle. It's strange. Like, um, and I saw this comparison on the internet uh, that people were saying, you know, why don't we g give the same treatment to indie films versus, uh, you know, um, your AAA titles? Because, you know, you'll go to the cinema and you'll play the same price regardless. Uh, and, it's, you know, a very similar thing can be said for music, uh, if you, especially if you're buying digitally per song or whatever. You know, we're all looking about a dollar, two dollars for a song. You know, there seems to be a general kind of uh, price uniform uh, uniformity, I do, guess, that doesn't exist in gaming world. Do you feel like it's a bit of a paradox, though? Like, I mean, if an indie game 
got given the AAA treatment, let's mm. say, then and then it proves to be a mass success because of the marketing and not really based on its merit as a game, suddenly everyone's making sequels of it every year and it becomes a AAA title. So maybe the sense that the indie game might not be capable of being marketed on that level simply because it is an indie game and as soon as it is marketed on that level it stops being an indie game well no man's sky exactly yeah <laughs> like that yeah because i i mean it, 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 it comes from indie beginnings but the way it's been treated and the way and the hype train that's around this bloody thing uh it's very hard to call it a you know i saw well you gotta look at that's a massive failing on sony's behalf i believe yeah, because okay. They haven't had any major, outside of Uncharted, for around the time. They didn't have any major games. So they put the guys who made Joe Danger on the stage at E3, which even if you're not a game punter, most of them know what E3 is, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the only conference that everyone watches. And you have them promising the world mm -hmm. of this game that's procedurally generated. People who play a lot of indie games know that procedurally generated means, oh, not very interesting and kind of empty places. And because it's on the main stage at E3, they're like, this game is going to be so amazing. And then it's made by 12 people. Yeah. Like, if you expected No Man's Sky to be what the hype that Sony put behind it, like, chances are you don't know a lot about game development, right? Because it's kind of impossible. I feel a lot... And that's, like... that's the issue with a lot of these indie games is they get hyped to the point by the wrong, for the wrong reasons, and then when they come out and they're not that great, then the average player who isn't already, like, uh, invested in indie development is just kind of like, uh, that was kind of a waste of 15 bucks. Yeah. It's kind of my personal feelings. You make a really interesting point there um, that, you know, the, the hype train, and, and, I, and I think, you know, uh, gaming media has a big responsibility and uh, and is to blame for a lot of that kind of um, hype, that the unnecessary hype or undeserved hype. But I think you made an interesting point that um, indie games sometimes hype the wrong part of the game and the wrong aspect, um, you know, to, yeah, to, yeah. the wrong aspects to grab people in, I guess. Something that AAA yeah, titles are obviously doing better. Mm. Yeah, we, I think as um, indie developers, we're starting. We're going to start seeing the formation of, I guess you would call it double A. So you look at something like oh. The Witness, that's forty dollars, and um, like I don't know if you guys, uh, I'm probably a bit older than you guys, but I remember like you had your budget line of PC titles that were all like twenty bucks, and they were okay games. They weren't amazing, but they were much bigger than most of the indie titles today, right? Mm -hmm. And then you look at something like The Witness, like. That was 40 bucks, and a lot of people complained about that, but that still sold a whole bunch of copies and is a great game. It's a much bigger game. It took longer to develop, and I think we're going to get more studios that are entering that space. And we'll get to a point where paying $30 or $40 for a game isn't such, because we've been paying $10, $15 for so long, right? Um, once we start seeing that quality jump and the length like uh, sort of rise up to those expectations, then we're going to see a new shift into this sort of bigger, better indie game. And we're still going to have the small stuff that's interesting and exciting, but I think we're going to get more towards a witness angle in the next couple of years. With with this double A concept, do you think that large triple A producers would maybe drop down to that level as well? Maybe try and get it on that? Yeah, for sure. Like, um, even on like the smaller games that we're working on, a surprise tag games, like we need a producer. Um, a lot of indie teams need a producer. So I think... If you were given a decent enough salary or believed in a project long enough and you were one of a thousand producers at EA, for instance, and you wanted to be part of something like a bigger role on a smaller team, like, yeah, I would personally, I would take that jump for sure if I believed in the project. Hmm. Well, I, I, I think... mean, you think of Double Fine, right? Like Double Fine yeah. are pretty much doing this every release now. Some of them work, some of them don't. But that's kind of where I think most we want to see the next rise. We want to see an influx of that size studio. Like even someone like Defiant here locally, like they are entering that space. Hand of Fate was a little bit bigger than your traditional indie game. And I think Hand of Fate 2 is going to be even bigger again. So that's going to be more of a double A experience, right? Yeah. Uh, Jacob Janurka as well, who we mentioned at the uh, the top of the thing uh, with his game Paradigm, is basically firmly sitting within that that role as well. It's not an indie price. It's uh, not a triple A price. It's kind of right in the middle. There. It's also getting um, you know a little bit a little bit more coverage than the average indie game as well. So it is sitting in that kind of you know a, a deserved kind of realm mm. of all aspects. That's right. Look, Steve, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for joining us today on uh, this episode of Pixel Sift. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's been fun. Uh, thanks uh, for everyone who's been tuning in uh, for joining us on Pixel Sift. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the show. And we'll be putting links up on our website, which is www.pixelsift.com.au. Scott, where can people find us on the social media? People find us at facebook.com forward slash pixel sift, twitter.com forward slash pixel sift, twitch.tv forward slash pixel sift, and youtube.com forward slash pixel sift au. And Mitch, our other episodes, they're still on the internet. Where can people go find <laughs> yeah, them? Yeah, they're still on the internet yeah. on that website. No one's coming to our house and
and taken away the old episodes no, like the old our episode. Xbox 360s. Yeah, but like Pixel Civ 4.5, no. Okay, anyway, they're, go- they're going to be out on on uh, iTunes later on this week and on the RSS link on our page. That's all we've got time for, but thank you very much for joining in. Peace out. See ya. Gotcha. Yeah.